Welcome everyone to this week's episode of VGN Weekly. As always, we will recap all the VGN broadcasted events right here. We will also have in-depth interviews of your favorite drivers, sponsor, league owners, and more. So subscribe and like the broadcast. And also, don't forget to hit that notification bell so you can get notified every time VGN hits the airwaves. Also, if you're a league owner and you have a broadcasting need, please go out to virtualgrip.net, fill out the form, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Well, welcome and thank you for joining us this joining us this week our guest this week will be none other than steve hilbert steve's first race with the brl was back on february 13th 2021 and he debuted at southern national raceway steve does have a win in the street stocks right there at southern national he's also one one of the guys uh, that helps behind the scenes at brl he's actually the one that uh processes all new applicants into the league but before we get to Steve, we need to recap all the VGN action from this past week. This week, the Bootleg Racing League was in action at the New Samarina Speedway down in Florida. The first race of the evening was uh, on, it happened on Saturday night was the SK Modifieds. Chris Hazlip and Joe Sagala would lead the field to green. A quick caution would come out that would reset the field with Hazel up in the lead and I actually found myself restarting on the outside of the front row. I would grab the lead from Chris on the exit of turn two. Joe Segala would follow me in as he took over second and Donnie Moore would actually slide into third place. The race would actually see several cautions throughout the evening uh, and a late race caution actually would set up a thrilling finish. A couple of restarts within within 10 to go would actually happen. The first restart with just a couple laps to go would see Donnie Moore grab the top spot and then see a green-white checkered that would see Donnie actually go on to take the win. The point leader Todd Liston would come home second and Joe Sagala would round out your podium. Trey Bloom and Jeffrey Harden, our next week's guest, will round out the top five there. The next race of the evening was the late model stocks same track me there at New Smyrna. The modified winner, Donnie Moore, would start on the pole with Todd Liston joining him on the front row. Once again, we would see a early race caution uh, and then see a restart that would see Donnie jump back out in the lead with Joseph Snyder actually taking second from Todd Liston. That's how they'd run till about lap 30 when Todd would actually start to really, really press Joe Snyder for that second spot, eventually taking it over and set sail for Donnie. He would eventually wrestle the lead from Donnie uh, just a few laps later. And after that, Donnie's wraith would actually eventually go south when he was racing for second with Joe Snyder. They would catch lap traffic and end up almost being three wide coming out of the corner there. Donnie and Jeff Kemper would make contact on the end of the corner, exit of the corner, sending Donnie into the wall and giving Donnie some damage and essentially taking him out of contention. Lap 88 would see Snyder turn the pressure up on Todd Liston. These two would battle side by side for the next few laps with Snyder finally getting the top spot away from Liston and he would actually bring the point leader John Wilson along with him on the inside and that's how they would go on to finish with Snyder winning, Wilson second and Adam Shane would sneak in there to come home third. Trey Bloom would finish fourth, and Todd Liston would fall back to fifth to round out your top five. Actually, it was another great racing night of racing from the BRL. I don't know how many races this year for BRL have seen lead changes, whether it be tires, incidents, whatever, within the next, last 10 laps, cautions to, to pack it up to give a lot of excitement. This has been a, a season for the books over in BRL. Make sure you catch them on Saturday nights to see some of this action. You don't want to miss it. Uh, we will pre preview their next race coming up at South Boston this Saturday night, but we'll do that a little later. Next up will be our conversation with Steve Hilbert, but we're, first we need to take a quick timeout.
This is your chance to get behind the wheel. The opportunity to race just like the pros. From the grassroots levels, where we all got our start, to the most popular race cars on the planet. From the fairgrounds of Nashville to the high banks of Daytona, to tracks that will never be forgotten. Realistic driving, intense competition, all from the comfort of your own home. This is the ultimate motorsports simulation. This is iRacing. Welcome back to VGN Weekly. And now, as promised, we do have Steve Hilbert joining us. And Steve, how are you doing today? Doing great, John. How are you? Well, I'm doing good. Well, real quick before we get into getting to know you a little better, uh, can you kind of recap for us how your new Smyrna race went? Uh, uh, first with the SKs, how'd that race go for you? It went south in a hurry. <laughs> um, I got, got loose real early and got tapped and uh, spun back, went back into the uh, inside wall and went in to get the damage fixed. Didn't think I had much, and when I came out, it, I just couldn't keep it straight, so parked it. Yeah, that's a tough track to make any kind of contact with the wall. It, it's, a, it's a high speed track, and usually when you get into something, it, it usually hurts the car pretty good. Well, how did you fare any better with the late model? Uh, yeah, late models was okay. I had a strategy that I've used on some where I, I just want to basically stay on the lead lap, try to get to the end of the race, wait for that caution, and then have my tires and go from there. And uh, there was only like one caution up before that. And then, so I was pretty well spent by that point. Well, that's a good strategy. That's usually what I try to do in those late model races. Just finish the race with the with that new tire model on there. Sometimes that's easier said than done. Um, well, you know what? Let's dive into how you uh, got into to sim racing. Uh, from what I understand, talking to you the other night, you don't have that long history of uh, playing console games and and all that kind of stuff. Tell me uh, how you you got into sim racing. Yeah, I have no history of any prior games. Um, sim racing, as back in 2020, I fell and uh, hurt my leg and ended up laid up for quite a while and, uh, you know, trying to figure out something to do. My Actually, my kids and grandkids suggested iRacing, and I happened to watch one of the races that was on Anki SPN. I thought, wow, it looks pretty cool. So I... Uh, Decided I'd give it a shot and went and bought the computer, got set up, and had no idea what I was doing when I started out. But that was how I got started. What was your biggest surprise uh, when you first got into iRacing? Because, you know, I mean, Stephen Spees gives me such grief about saying it's a video game. Did you have a video game you know, expectations, or or did you think, it, okay, this is going to be a simulation with all the settings in the cars that you've got to make, adjustments? Uh, what was your biggest surprise coming into the sim world? Uh, my, yeah, my, I was expecting, I think, a video game and realized it's nothing like that at all. Um, yeah, my, <laughs> my first setup, I didn't realize I was going to need really any of the stuff to, to set up. I had my little monitor set in front of me, and I bought some Logitech wheels and pedals. I attached the wheel to a two by eight pine board, and had it sitting across the arm of my this recliner. And I thought, "Oh, that'll work." And <laughs> it, it was it was ridiculous. How long did you get into it before you uh, you upgraded? Oh, that next day I started. <laughs> I started looking for stuff, but I I knew nothing about iRacing, racing, had nothing at mm -hmm. all. Um, I hadn't watched it on YouTube. I had I'd seen the race on ESPN and heard the kids to you know talk about it and stuff. So I then started to look look towards it some, and yeah, those first few races, if I'd ever go back and watch those, would be <laughs> horrible. 
Well, you said you upgraded the next day. What what did you upgrade? Did you uh, get rid of the pine board? Did you get a new wheel? Did you get a new monitor? What did you upgrade to? Uh, I kept the wheel and pedals, uh, got a bigger monitor, and made uh, my own sort of little rig to, to get by. I used it for quite a while and then just kept modifying it a little bit and working it up. I don't have much space, so my rig's actually on casters uh so i wheel it to me um <laughs> nice. yeah and so that works out pretty well well that sounds like the perfect setup you know just go room to room in the house wherever you feel like uh, running it and that'd be kind of fun actually but um well you know being relatively new and, and into the into sim racing uh I, I assume you found the brl pretty quickly correct uh yeah I was actually with uh, Ryan Seneca. It was in a street stock race uh, that we were racing against, and I knew the name Seneca from uh, racing, following racing throughout the years. And I uh, got talking with him a little bit after the race, and he asked if I'd ever thought about running in a league. And I actually had no idea what leagues even did in iRacing. racing, and um, so I that's how I got started. Applied and went from there how did he sell you on it was it uh i mean what did he anything that he said that made you interested i mean like i said how did he sell you on it um he just kind of talked up the league and i he had instant credibility with the seneca name and yeah i thought yeah i'll try it um and that was that was an eye-opening experience too uh first race i remember I practiced so much that whole week to, and all I was doing was street stocks, 40 lap race practice like crazy the whole week. And I thought, yeah, you know, I got this pretty well and went out to during practice and went out for the first lap or two. And then I hear, you know, my spotter comes on, gives me my time. I thought that's my best ever. And then it's followed by you're running last. <laughs> I thought, wow, <laughs> my best is good enough for last in this. So Boy, right. you, you are a, a greatly improved driver, probably one of the most improved over the last, you know, six months or so in the league. But, uh, you know, what uh, what light bulb moments have you had that to make those jumps behind the wheel? I mean, you've gone, like you said, from being towards the back to being towards the, the middle, towards the front in some races. Even um, what's been the what's been the difference there where you've picked up that pace? Uh, I think just seat time as much as anything, and then. You know, I've had guys that work with me. I bet, you know, you get to know the guys a little bit and ask them for help here and there. And they've always been great about, you know, stepping in to help you with stuff. And you just, you get better with experience and that's, that's get a little more confidence and then you improve from there. What do you, uh, what do you wish you would have known the day that you went and decided to get iRacing and get online your, your first race? What, what do you wish you would have known then that you do now? I wish I would have realized how much information is available on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> and I would have, you know, I think once I watched some races and all that, it was like, oh, wow, you can do this. You can do that. And I had no idea you could change the view. Um, and first few races i felt like i was sitting in the trunk and uh just little things like that was my own fault because i was so anxious to get out and start racing that i i didn't need to go through all that instruction and all that stuff and you know i, I was wrong <laughs> so, yeah yeah because you're expecting a video game right <laughs> yeah ex yeah exactly well, you know, you mentioned about, you know, being eager to get out and, and, and race, and, and that comes from probably being a race fan first and foremost. Uh, tell me, how did your, your love of racing begin? Uh, you know, what are your connections to the sport, you know, uh, you know, starting, you know, whenever it picked up? How did you get into racing? Yeah, I mean, as a kid, my dad, uh, friends, we live in a small town in Ohio, and guy from our town, uh, was a racer, uh, Vern Schrock and my dad and he were friends and we would go follow Vern to, to watch him race and stuff. And it just kind of hit from there. Um, I know you're a dirt guy and first race that I ever really remember was a dirt track. And 
I had, I think it was in Western Pennsylvania somewhere, but, um, but it was, it was a lot of fun and, uh, just followed Vern through and then Vern's two boys, Buddy and Donnie Schrock, uh, they started racing. Donnie was one of my best friends and, uh, went through ASA and all that. And it just stayed from there. Yeah, you, you speak of the ASA. I have to wonder if you and Ryan didn't cross paths and just didn't know it at somewhere because the Seneca name, for, for those of you that don't know, is, is synonymous with ASA racing. Uh, those were, you know, me growing up and watching the ASA, you know, it, it, you know, it was Seneca and, and Mike Eddy and, and Dick Trickle and those guys. So, um, yeah, I have to wonder if you two haven't didn't cross paths somewhere and, and didn't know it. Yeah, I've. I, he and I talked about that back when it first started. He was probably the one of those little Seneca kids running around the <laughs> place when I was there. But uh, yeah, uh, Vern Schrock actually won Winchester 400. Oh, wow. I think the year or so before Bob Seneca started on that streak of five or six Winchester 400s in a row. It was a dry power 400 back then. So. Yeah, winning a winning a race at Winchester is especially for short track racing. That's like you know, if you're an open wheel guy winning at Indy or a Daytona guy or a stock car guy winning at Daytona, Winchester is one of those crown jewel tracks that um, you know, if I ever had a victory there, that trophy would be front and center with almost anything else that I would win. Um, how much do you remember from that win? From Burns win? Yeah. Uh, nothing. I, we weren't at that race. Um, oh, okay. Started, but, but I remember talking with Donnie about it. Uh, and it was, you know, that was a big thing for them. So. Absolutely. Well, you know, that's, um, it, it amazes me. You know, I ask folks all the time how they, they, they get into racing or it comes and it's usually a father, son or her family. And, that's one of the neat things about the sport and talking about family, you know, you kind of have a sibling rivalry. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your brother and, and let's just be honest. Uh, what are the bragging rights? Like, are they, are they weekly? Is it a season champ, you know, season points? So what's that sibling rivalry like? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're only 11 months apart. Um, and oh, so it's a real rivalry. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. We went through school you know, I was one year ahead of him and, you know, we played sports together, you know, grew up together. We did every, everything we did. Uh, and yeah, Tom and I, I mean, we get along great, but yeah, there's definitely a rivalry there. I thought he didn't have any interest in eye racing either until, you know, I was in it and kept telling him, you know, man, you need to set up, you need to get a setup. You need to do this. And, uh, finally I, sent him a link to watch one of our races and then i you know called afterwards this what do you think and he's he was just impressed and liked it and next thing you know he was hey i think i'm gonna get that and so he's got he's got a really nice setup uh and he's i'm proud of him man he's getting better all the time uh and you know gives us something we have in common we can do and practice in the evenings and stuff and how much trash talk? How much trash talking is going on? Oh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any of it carry over to the family event or anything? Yeah. Everybody just kind of roll their eyes at you guys and you start talking. They, you know, yeah, you got into me last week or, oh, you beat me last week, you know, or any of that kind of stuff. Do you guys uh, kind of have your own thing that everybody else just kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> has to look at from afar? Yeah. It's kind of our own thing. Uh, but the kids, grandkids, well, the grandkids think it's great that we do this. The kids think, oh, yeah, dad's going to go back on the computer and race or whatever um, until they watch one. And then it's like, you know, it's like, wow, that's really slow. That's not what they're expecting either. They're expecting, a, you know, a little computer game or something. So it's, have any of them have any of them gotten behind the wheel? Have you let them in your rig to drive it? Uh, yeah, they've tested it out, but my, my sons don't really have any interest in that. Now my youngest son has some interest in racing, but, um, but the, of the grandkids, I have a couple that show some interest, actually twin girls, 
Um, uh oh. Yeah, I bet, you I bet you their mom and dad are, are real happy. You're you're now the bad influence. You can't go well, to grandpa's. <laughs> well, they're they're just getting their licenses. Uh, so Jeez. we actually brought them in, put it on test on some uh, road courses, and had them driving around like that. And thought, ah, uh, you know, got to learn. Funny, something. I've had I've had I've had my daughter doing the same thing, just to practice the braking and and turning and. And all that. So uh, that oh, cool. I'm glad I'm not the only one that's done that with uh, folks that are trying to figure out how to drive. Yeah, yeah, they uh, they they improved quite a bit. Um, but yeah, they'd spend a lot of time back here doing that. Very very cool. Well, you know, I you 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 know you talk about the rivalry back and forth, and and like I said, is it is it a is it a weekly thing, or do you guys pay attention to the the bigger battle like seasons end? I mean, do you got any friendly bets? Is I guess what I'm asking. Uh no, not yet. That's probably coming. He's <laughs> he's he's caught up in some stuff past me. Uh, he races in another league in uh, yesteryear's. Mm. league okay. and he actually won the one series of that in the road series so oh nice um, yeah yeah i guess if you like road racing <laughs> so well it, but, it's fun i mean it's something yeah. different i i stink at it but it, it's cool to get outside your comfort zone and yeah. do something a little different that's how i view it anyway yeah that's that's one of the rivalry things we do he you know he likes that stuff and I don't, so I get on him about the road road portion. Have you guys tried to do any of the team events where you guys would be teammates, where you, you're you're using you know driving the same car but taking turns driving it during a race? No, we haven't we haven't done any of that stuff. Um, you should I, try some point. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I've I heard some of you guys talk. It sounds like it would be. Yeah, it, it is. And, it, you know, and the, the whole concept behind, you know, for those of you who don't know, are um, we, two people can, you know, sign into the same server and you, you share one car. Uh, and just like what you would see on, uh, on TV, somebody would start uh, start the car. They would come in. You, you'll come in for your pit stop and you can do a driver switch. Uh, you, you, you click a button where you're getting out of the car and the other guy gets in the car and off you go. Um, you got to use the same setup. So just like real life, if one guy likes kind of a tight setup, one guy likes a loose setup, you got to compromise. Um, but those are all a lot of fun. You, you really uh, you guys should talk about it. But you'll lose the sibling rivalry. I guess you'll have to be like frenemies for the, the three hours or, or longer that you guys are uh, doing that, though. Yeah, that's how, I mean, there's nobody that I'm trying to beat more than him out there. Uh, and you can he's, try it with lap times. You can battle with lap times. You can get the quick lap. <laughs> yeah, and he's, he's the same way. But at the same time, there's nobody I'd rather see win a race than him, too. Um, yeah. and it's been that way our whole lives. Well, that is fantastic. It's cool to see the you guys on there, and I know Soup uh, on the broadcast. Uh, you know, it probably uh, helps that rivalry along because uh, he does point it out frequently. Uh, you guys, I'm sure you guys get a kick out of that, right? Oh yeah, yeah. He's yeah, uh, yeah he's been on that since the start. So him, uh, yeah. so Lowell does too. When yeah. Tom and I end up getting together and. Which when they, he started was weekly, uh, we'd spin each other out somehow or something, and I'd see the reports come out, and then Lowell would have some comment about it on there, and uh, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. He mentioned that uh, I think last night actually. But uh, let me ask you. You know, you 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 not only you're on the track and, and drive, but uh, you actually handle the applications for BRL. Uh, tell me what you do during that process. Um, when somebody applies to the league, it comes to me, and I uh, basically got a database of everybody that's ever been in BRL, which is. Wow. That was another shock. That it's huge. Um, check the database. Make sure that they're if they were in BRL before, they're they didn't leave under some kind of bad terms or have any kind of issues with that. And then I'll uh, typically check them through Rye Racing, see what their stats are, and see how that kind of looks. And if they're going to be let in, then I'll send them a welcome letter and invitation, and go from there. They get a, they select a car number and it's, 
it's I don't know, it's something I guess to help blow out some. Yeah. So, you know, we keep this here between you and I. So, do you think it would work if uh, all of a sudden I had a, a bunch of dirt guys showing up uh, or uh, applying and saying they're wanting to run like the dirt street stocks? You think what would bring that league back? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it was with dirt guys when they applied, but I think they they read the first sentence where this is at their, where they apply, and that was it. <laughs> um, there'd be well, you know, us dirt guys, we're not the the most sophisticated folks on the planet. Um, we just want to get in the car and go fast. But, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of cool. that, And you saw the trans uh, transitions, uh, you know, between both the dirt and all that. Um, we're getting ready to, to redo now the, the street stocks, open invitations back up for the street stocks. Um, what has that been like? Have we been getting a lot of applications in for that? Uh, not a lot yet. We've gotten a few. Um, I mean, we'll have a we'll have to have good car counts, but not, we haven't gotten a ton of them yet. Um, but that's I look for once it gets going, then we'll get quite a few after that. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your help. I guess I should say first of all in the league because that that does mean that you're one of the guys that kind of makes this league what it is, and it is one of one of the best uh run leagues here and, and you're a part of that so thank you um i'm sure i can speak on uh, most everybody in the league uh, that you know thank you for uh, helping out with that sure it's uh it, i don't know i don't feel like i do that much but i guess when you're dealing with you all do. the stuff he does it's it, i think anything helps so. yeah his biggest job is probably dealing with me i'm always uh pestering about something or another some crazy idea so uh it's all downhill after he gets done with me i guess but um well let me uh let, let's move on now to a little bit about you um so where are you from and and, and originally and where are you located now i'm in plain city it's a little yep. town west of columbus uh it's where i was born and raised and went to school and my I think it's third or fourth generation that are from here. And um, nice. yeah, and that's where I'm at now. Well, you know, you know anybody that's watched a, a BRL broadcast knows that you've had a, a, an interesting job. I know that you are retired now, but you're a police chief, correct? Correct. Well, tell me a little about that, that, that job. Uh, you know, were you a state trooper? Were you, you know, in the sheriff's office? Were you local? Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your your journey through the police force. Yeah, I uh, started as a state trooper, and it's I don't know that was a little different than how everybody else did too. I um, I was never that kid sitting in third grade. Oh, I want to be a policeman when I grow up. I wanted to. Do, I, I had no thoughts at all of ever being in police work. Um, but I graduated from high school and didn't want to go to college, just wanted to get a job and go on with life. Um, so actually my father and, and my uncle and grandfather owned a filling station in our town that they had sold the business out a year or so before. And I'd worked there off and on my whole life for dad and them. And, uh, the guy that had it wasn't doing great and, had decided he was going to sell it. So I was only 17 when I graduated and turned 18. And I thought, you know what? I'd, I'd like to buy that. So I walked up to the bank and talked to the banker and he said he would loan me the money and went down to dad, told him I wanted to buy the station. I had the money. And, um, so he owned the building. I owned the business for three or four years and turned 21. I was just, kind of getting bored with it. And he walked in one day and he says, you know, you seem miserable. He says, working in here. He says, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. I said, I always thought being a state trooper would be kind of cool. He said, then you need to go home, shower and go apply. And I did. And then became a, troop, a trooper and got stationed over north of Dayton for first seven or eight years. And then transferred to a couple other posts and then eventually settled into crash reconstruction analysis and oh wow did that 
Well, when you talk about crash construction and all that, uh, what kind of training? I've always, I mean, that's a, that's a really hard job to do because there's so many things that can come into play. Uh, you almost like you're, you're solving a, a Rubik's Cube uh, probably every time you go into one of those. What kind of training did you go through for that? Oh, uh, we went through a ton. Uh, Institute of Police Technology in Florida, we took a lot of the specialty courses and crash reconstruction courses there. Um, took some through Northwestern. Um, and then just through doing it and some of the computer courses. And yeah, we were, we were kind of at the forefront of a lot of the stuff. We did forensic animations back, you know, when I was in the late eighties, when I was doing that stuff, early nineties, uh, and nobody was doing that stuff yet. Uh, and that kind of, that as the technology evolved, we kind of evolved with that. Um, I tell people, I remember when we've, our crash reconstruction analysis unit got new computers. We got these things called a Pentium. So that was, everybody was just, you know, dying to see that we had people that would come in to see, you know, our computers. And I look at it now and it's, it's nothing at all compared to what's out today. So today's stuff is so far beyond it's, it's amazing. Do you think that new technology has just made it uh, easier to kind of reconstruct, or do you think it's also made it more accurate? Is, is it both, or is it just uh, just kind of made it easier and and easier to process that stuff? I think it's probably both. Um, I mean, when we were doing it, we had the drafting tables, we were drawing scale drawings, oh, really, and, yeah, and all that, ah. and then then we went to, you know, we're doing a vector sum analysis where we do a scale drawing and draw the cars in at impact and their approach angles and departure angles and weights and start calculating speeds and stuff from that. Uh, and then, you know, now, first of all, I got black boxes in most of the cars. So they yeah. plug it in and it tells them what it is. So we were doing that by, by hand and then having to go to court and yeah. testify with all that and, explain the math and everything in ways that the juries would understand and which is uh, probably next to impossible because you know if your skid marks are 60 feet then you got to figure out the weight of the car the weather conditions oh my gosh i bet you that was really tough to dissect in front of juries it, it was um but it's not like the csi on tv where it's a quick explanation and the conviction oh and you get it done by by dinner right yeah 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 and you get your results back right away too <laughs> um but i i think one of the reasons we were so successful with it was we'd go typically we were going the other side would be engineers well they were speaking engineer terms and the jury you know would listen to everyday talk and the way we explain things better. And I think that helped as much as anything. So. Yeah, I, that would have probably been a, a process too, because I have to imagine when you first were, like you said, on the cutting edge of that. So when you would go in probably with these engineering terms, you know, you guys probably lost juries probably early on and then figured out how to do that. Um, that is incredible. Uh, it really, really is. But that's not the only job in, in public service that you've done, too. You were an a, a administrator, too, correct? Yeah. Well, I went from the patrol. Um, we we're actually, I'd been in the patrol about 13, 14 years. And was actually at a cookout at, my, at Tom's house. And Tom happened to live next door to the mayor in our hometown in Plain City. And I saw him over there, didn't really know him, but, you know, just make small talk. I said, hey, I said, how's everything going? Are you keeping the town in line? He said, oh, he said, it's not, he said, it's not bad. He said, it'd be a lot better if you'd come be our police chief. And so that was how the police chief thing started. I thought, yeah, there's no way. I love the highway patrol. I'm happy there. It's a great job. But then the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, this would be kind of fun to come home you know, take the chief's job and all that kind of stuff. And then that's how the chief's portion started. And I had ended up taking it obviously and stayed in that for 12 more years and then retired. And then, yeah, then was the city administrator. 
Do you, do you, do you miss patrolling? Uh, no. <laughs> no? <laughs> I, I, I miss the people. Uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't miss it in today's atmosphere at all. Oh, I can um, imagine. The things were way different back then. And now the, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I would, uh, <laughs> I would, uh, I don't think I'd enjoy it near as much today. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, like the reconstruction stuff we're talking about, I mean, I would have to think, uh, you know, even though sometimes things were, were tragic, you know, that would have happened out there on the roads and all that, but it had to be rewarding though when you when everything would come to fruition at the end of it i i understand that the patrolling and, and and the dangers now but i mean some of that stuff though i would think uh i mean that's stuff that would get in your blood would it wouldn't it it did uh and actually when i left the, in the patrol you couldn't have the second employment like that oh okay when I, when I left the patrol i did so i could continue privately with crash reconstruction and I just get hired outside to do crashes and that kind of stuff and did that for a few years and was really success, successful with that. But it got to the point I had to make a choice. Do I want to do that full time and give up law enforcement or give this up and stay with law enforcement? Um, because it, just, it got a little overwhelming. I was getting so many calls for the reconstruction stuff. However, uh, at that point, I had 15, 16 years in, in law enforcement. I thought, yeah, hey, I'm going to have a pension, all that. And so I, I ended up just backing away from crash reconstruction and stuff. So I do miss that, that part of it. Well, I guess my, my final police-associated question that I'd have for you, did any of your high-speed, if you got any, any high-speed chases, any of that help with eye racing and, and driving fast and having to make quick decisions? Uh, actually, it, it does. Um, really? I, I taught uh, our driving schools with patrol, too. Mm. Um, and some of that was, it, it's not at high speed. Some of it is. We, go to, we would go to Transportation Research Center up uh, by Honda at their track and do some of that. Um, and yeah, I'm a lot better chasing than being chased. <laughs> um, so, so I think it helps some with it. You like having that carrot out there to to go after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the same way. Uh, well, you know, you're retired now. So, what is retired life like for you? Uh, do you do you get to travel? Uh, do you have any hobbies? Uh, kind of, what are you doing now these days, other than i racing? Uh, I'm not retired completely. I'm retired oh. from law enforcement in the city. Oh, so, okay. So what are you yeah. doing now then? <laughs> well, the natural progression from law enforcement to that, I am the general manager of a hair salon and day spa. Oh, I can see that transition. I bet you that happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I've done it now for over 10 years. Um, it's, it's its own story. Uh, the, I imagine. People that, the people that own it were our best friends for 25 years. Um, and the city of Dublin was taking their salon through eminent domain for a big city project. So I had made a joke to him one time we we're talking. I said, someday I need to retire. Come run that place for you and we'll, you know, put some procedures and stuff in place so everything goes well. Because I had started, they had an employee theft issue that I helped mm. them get through. And it was a joke. We just all laughed about, oh, could you imagine seeing you at the spa? And about a year later, I got home from the city. It was one of those days where, you know, just everybody complaining about everything and walked in. And my Kathleen says, she goes, hey, she goes, don't even change. We got to go meet with them. They want to talk to you about running the spa. But I've never even been to the spa, so so anyway, <laughs> I uh, ended up doing that. Got through the acquisition of a new building, got it renovated, and everything moved over. And during all that, ended up to where it's like, yeah, this is really a pretty neat business, and uh, still there today. And it's it's fairly, I mean, it's a big kind of an exclusive salon. There's 68 employees, and oh wow, that you know, is huge yeah it's, yeah it's an eighteen thousand square foot space and wow it's uh so yeah it's a busy little place 
So you you retired to kind of maybe work a little harder. It sounds like maybe uh, managing all that. Um, wow, that's a that's pretty cool. But you know, you you sound like you because you mentioned that you know you enjoyed missing the people and all that. But that's a great way to to still. I would have to imagine uh, enjoy people and 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 working and and, and dealing with them, right? Um, I don't deal with for the most part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, because quite honestly, I don't know what what. They even do in the services and stuff. We have 40, <laughs> probably 40. Well, like there's 30 hairstylists. There's eight massage, eight nail techs, and I think eight estheticians. Wow. And then well, support staff. What's the name of the business? Give it a plug here. The Spa at River Ridge in Dublin, Ohio. And I assume that uh, if they look that up online, there's a website, everything that go along with it? Yep, the spot river ridge .com. Yeah. Anybody that's around the Columbus area, go check that out. And then tell them Steve sent you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Well, very cool. I, I've gotten to, to know you a little bit. Now, uh, I guess the next part of the interview here, let's see if I can uh, tweak you a little bit. We're going to do that word association here. So you ready for that? All right. All right. First one's going to be Buckeyes. Ah, champions. Wolverines. <laughs> <laughs> um, not champions again. And if the feed cuts, it's because Ryan's head just exploded. <laughs> and uh, how about the Reds or the Bengals? Oh... Uh, that's back to the civil sibling rivalry. Tom's a Bengals guy. I'm a Browns guy. So, oh, uh, yeah. how did you become a Browns? The Browns are all, like on the other side of the state. Yeah, yeah, but the Browns were around more when I was a little kid. Yeah, you know, that's Le Leroy Kelly, Jim Brown, all those guys. The Bengals came along later, and Tom, of course, became a Bengals guy. So I got to give him static about that. So. But yeah, I'm Browns, Browns, Indians. I, I like the Indians and the Reds, so I just I like baseball all around. Okay. Well, how about being the police chief or being the or the, the Illinois the state tro the Illinois the, the state trooper or the administrative job? Which one do you like better? Oh, I like the trooper police chief better. The administrators, yeah. it's yeah, but <laughs> that's just too much of everything. And then the last one, how about SK or the late model? Uh, depends on the track. Late model overall. Well, late model, that's a good choice. That'd be my choice, too. Um, well, you know what, Steve? It has been a, a pleasure talking to you and all that here. We'll kind of wrap the, the interview up with that. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. You guys do a great job. Well, thank you very much. Well, you know, we got one thing to do yet before uh, we, we, we move on, though. We do have to talk about, uh, the you know, what's coming up on VGN this week. And uh, I know the, the Bootleg Racing League is going to head to South Boston, one of the the original tracks in iRacing, I think. Uh, um, first, you know, what's your first thoughts when, when you hear the word South Boston? Ugh. <laughs> well, you got it. Last time we were there, do you, I don't know if you remember, but you got a top five in the late model. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Sobo's uh, it's one that I've worked a lot at, um, and it's two lanes. You can usually get you know two lines going. Um, so, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll do okay there. Um, it's it. I've had good finishes. Don't enjoy the track a whole lot but uh i think probably because i end up practicing there more because you know it, it's not one that i feel super comfortable at well donnie moore leads all active uh drivers in the sk he's got four wins there including the last time bro was there 
Several drivers, though, on the, the late model side are, are tied uh, with just one win. Matt Hoos uh, won last season's uh, race there. Donnie Moore was second, so I think Donnie's going to be tough there. And there's a, a lot of guys, too, including me. i got to promote myself for a minute. Uh, that have wins in the SK there. Um, you know, you, you talk about the practice. So what, do you, what do you find to be the one of the challenges about getting around there? Uh, throttle control coming out of the corners. Um, and to, to me, as I remember it, the SK and the late model seem completely, you can practice one on that track, doesn't really help you with the other one on that track. Uh, they're completely different there. Yeah, I will agree, and it's a it's you know it's a pretty narrow track and everything else. You get offline just a little bit, and you can you can sink in a quick hurry there. So, um, yeah, that's where we're going to be headed uh, this week. Uh, you can uh, tune in Saturday night. Uh, first up will be the SKs, then they'll be followed by the the late models. Um, but uh, you know what? Well, that'll uh, kind of wrap our show up here this week. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for for watching and uh, tuning in once again. Next week, like I, I said, Jeff Harden will be our guest uh, once again. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and remember remember to give us a like, a subscribe, and also click the notification bell. Uh, so you are notified every time BGN takes the airways. I want to thank once again, Steve, uh, for you for joining us uh, here this week. And uh, hopefully we get to talk to you again here up in the upcoming months. We can touch on maybe a little bit more of the, the Browns and, and, and Bengal rivalry, among some other things. All right. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yep. And also, remember, if you have a broadcasting need, please go to virtualgrip.net, fill out the form, and we can get back to you. And once again, thank you for, for joining us, and we'll see you next week right here on Virtual Grip Weekly.